Hello and welcome to the World Extreme Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Wood. I'm a critical care and EM nurse practitioner, medic, and World Extreme Medicine enthusiast. And I'm joined today by Dr. Jocelyn Kelly. Dr. Kelly is the Director of Gender Rights and Resilience at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, and she is the founding director of the Women in War program. She has extensive international experiencing, uh, experience promoting human rights issues. Welcome, Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Stephen. It's such a pleasure to be here. We're happy to have you. And our topic today is the unexpected impact of COVID in conflict. And I know, you know, COVID was on everyone's mind, everyone's agenda. Um, when it came to, you know, continuing medical education, I think we were all, you know, reading about COVID on a daily basis. What's the presentation? How do we, what are the symptoms? How do we manage this disease? Um, and it seemed, you know, for a while, maybe we were over flooded with COVID and we we're happy to see, you know, um, topics that uh, maybe were a little different than, than COVID. But this is really, I think, something much different than the kind of material that we were all reading about. And I think this would this will really draw some, some interest uh, because it really kind of looks outside of the small bubble that most of us have, um, which is COVID in our communities, and looks at it at a much larger kind of international stage. But not only that, it's going to be looking at COVID in kind of a specific context, um, and one that I don't think many of us think about, which is, you know, the impact of COVID in conflict areas. I think this is an incredibly interesting topic. I know our listeners are going to really enjoy hearing what you have to say. So let's start with um, your, what is your experience or background in, you know, in COVID in conflict um, areas in, in war zones? Yeah, so um, I'm a public health researcher who's been doing work in conflict and crisis since 2006. Actually, my first response was on um, to Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. And um, I arrived uh, in that crisis when, you know, cars were still in trees and dogs were still searching homes. And I think um, at that point, I was really struck by um, the fact that we can try to do thoughtful disaster management and um, respond with all of our best intentions. But unless you bring the voices of affected communities into that response, and unless you kind of draw on best practices and an evidence base, that you can really fail to make a situation better no matter how hard you try. And so um, with that experience um, in Katrina, I ended up going to grad school and becoming really interested in how um, vulnerable populations, people who are often left out of a response or can easily be overlooked are some of the most important voices because they're really the experts in their own situation and how to bring a lot of that input into how we think about responding to crisis and disaster. And um, through that process, I actually ended up working a lot in Central Africa. So Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, Central African Republic, South Sudan, and um, beyond. And I think the first time I went to DRC, I was so struck by what an extraordinarily beautiful and gracious and vital country it was. It was just um, an eye-opening experience. And I think that was in 2008. So I've actually been working with the same partners in some of the same towns ever since then um, and have continued this work to kind of try to uncover uh, yeah, the hidden narratives of how people are affected by crisis and what has been really striking when the COVID pandemic hit is that I was used to working in places that have experienced decades upon decades of instability. And um, these are what we call complex disasters, right? So these are places that have um, armed insecurity and may be affected by Ebola and also extreme poverty and then um, experience mudslides during the rainy season. So these are already tricky complex places and watching the COVID pandemic begin to overlay on top of that was, um, I think, gut-wrenching just as it was for you know everyone in the world watching this um, pandemic unfold. But there was also this kind of extreme sense of dread or anxiety about how these 
wonderfully strong, resilient communities that have been through so much and had, frankly, often very few resources, very little healthcare infrastructure, how those communities would be able to respond. Um, so that was, you know, a big part of the past year. And one of the biggest changes uh, personally that I experienced over the past year was the fact that I usually spend about 30 to 50 percent of my time um, in the communities that we work with in conflict and crisis. And, and none of that happens. So this has been a year of remote collaboration with our incredible local partners. And that has been really uh, rewarding, but hard as well. Um, so basically, one of the things that I worked on before COVID was understanding kind of this hidden mathematical architecture of how conflict and crisis can change communities. And maybe just to explain that a little bit more, um, when I did my dissertation, I'd already been working in DRC for about 10 years. And I noticed that there was just, um, while there was this resiliency in communities, there was also this deep sense of exhaustion as well. And there had been now generations of youth who have grown up not having ever experienced peace. And there was um, the striking realization that um, conflict was kind of in some ways a way of life or insecurity was a way of life. And I was curious about understanding or showing um, to people who hadn't experienced that, that reality. And so um, my dissertation was actually really focused on statistical methods. And so what uh, this research showed was I combined two data sets um, one a public health data set and one a political science data set. And the public health data set looked at interpersonal conflict, so conflict within the home or domestic violence. And the political science data set showed the intensity of conflict or the amount of conflict a certain place had experienced. And, um, and what I wanted to surface or visualize, make visible, was the fact that places that had experienced more conflict also um, experienced lots of hidden detrimental outcomes. And this was in fact the case. So um, using Liberia as a case study, one country, we combined these two data sets and showed that even five years after war, seven years after war was over, those districts that had experienced much higher levels of conflict had 50% um, higher rates of um, intimate partner violence, so violence within the home, right? And war is really visible. It's fought in public spaces, on roads, and, you know, it's reported in the media. Um, and what had kind of happened, or the way I sometimes think about it, was that war had kind of seeped into these invisible places. It had seeped into people's homes. And you wouldn't really have seen that unless you, one, had data to show it, right, from this wonderful public health data set which was the demographic health survey. And two, unless you linked that information with like previous conflict exposure information, and all of a sudden it kind of showed this like pulse or heartbeat of how conflict changes communities in really quiet, insidious ways. Um, so that's like a little bit of the background of where I was coming from in my research and the story um, that was the underlying story when COVID hit um, so many of these communities. Um, so I guess before uh, this turns into a longer monologue than it already is, I would just say that we were able to pivot over the past year and continue to collect data. Our wonderful um, local partners were able to make sure that uh, we were able to continue our work safely after a kind of hiatus um, where we paused and made sure that everyone was doing okay and we could see what we could resume and what we couldn't during the pandemic. And we were able to not only collect data, but actually pivot some of our programming to incorporate COVID prevention and COVID messaging into our work uh, over the past year, which is really exciting too. Um, yeah. Well, for one, um, make monologuing makes my job much easier and you're far more interesting than anything I'm going to have to say. So please feel free uh, to continue that. But uh, that I mean, that's just um, it's important work. It's amazing work. Um, you know, I think that these are are things that you know we've be, we've really as a I think as a you know we've certainly think about how COVID is affecting other countries. I think everyone was looking at the Italian experience 
you know, we're now looking at what's going on in India. Um, but I think we really centralize this to, to, you know, COVID to say, that's great. You know, let's, we might learn something from the Italian experience about medical management, um, about disaster, you know, management. We're learning something from the Indian experience. Uh, however, we're really, I think a lot of countries are just, you know, thinking closed border um, and, and how do we manage our own problems? And I don't think there has been really a, a fantastic, you know, world response to this. I think maybe, you know, we saw with Ebola um, that, you know, there seemed to be a much greater world response. But I think in part that was because it really never reached their borders. Um, and that has changed with COVID where, COVID has affected, to my knowledge, just about every country, um, except maybe North Korea, uh, according to North Korea. But but we really, you know, have some blinders when it comes to what's the impact in these other countries, and especially these countries that are just, you know, facing, already face conflict, that already have natural disasters that already face all sorts of, you know, biomedical um, disasters. And I w it worries me that, you know, we, we have really kind of um, be nationalized and we're focused more on what can we do here to stop this pandemic, which we certainly need to make those strides, but we also need to have a national, a, a world view on this. Do you, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you feel that, some of these countries that, you know, are at the greatest risk are getting the least attention or, you know, have you have you found something, you know, that that's different from that kind of thought line? So I spent so much time thinking about this and I love that you brought this up and I swear um, I did not plant this question, <laughs> but it is something so um, kind of near and dear to my heart in terms of where we go with our research, but also one of the things I've just spent a lot of time sitting with over this year when we've all had lots and lots and lots of time to think is the fact that this is, I, I would argue, um, I think our first true global experience, right? And before I traveled, I would say, no, 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 you know, World War One, World War Two, that what, those were not global experiences. Those were really big experiences to some countries and other countries were less involved in that. Um, you could talk about the Spanish flu and I think you know that was um, certainly a pandemic that we could talk about, but COVID is the first global experience that has hit us when the world is so small and you can fly around it in a day and people were. Right. So we're not only connected physically, but we're connected through um, all of this technology that makes the world immediate and intimate in a way that we, you know, have never experienced as a human race before. And I really would I, I'd like to see the kind of covid pandemic turn into a global empathy moment, a moment where we all for the first time acknowledge that these are risks that we all face. And as I say that, I fully acknowledge, and I think what we're gonna probably talk about a lot for the rest of the podcast is the fact that the risk was present for everyone, but the way that it hits is really different based on your um, you know, economic privilege and where you live and whether you have access to healthcare. So, um, I think empathy is an important way to think about it. We all face the same risk for the, probably the first time in the history of the world, but um, the way that that risk played out for every individual was extraordinarily different. And, you know, some of the most vulnerable places are places that are conflict affected. You know, um, I think and work a lot in refugee settings. So these are places with um, limited wash facilities, so water and sanitation facilities, extreme crowding, lack of privacy, and limited access to health care. So when you think about some of the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable, um, you think about displaced and IDP populations, and and yeah, those who are conflict affected. Um, and maybe the, the second side of the coin that 
you mentioned, Stephen, and is something that is actually very top of mind in the work that we are currently doing, is um, I became very interested in how um, communities define themselves and how um, kind of intangibles or invisible dynamics actually uh, have an enormous influence on very visible outcomes. And so I know that sounds very opaque, but one of the things I think about, and it's related to, you know, this idea of the contagion of violence or the long shadow that war casts is what are the mechanisms that that plays out through? And I think um, something that we're looking at more and more in my program are invisible things like social cohesion, individual resilience, feelings of self-efficacy, how mental health plays into the way that you respond to conflict and maybe the ways you propagate or don't propagate violence. Um, a lot of what we do is also look at conceptions of in-groups and out-groups. So who do you think is like you and who do you think is not like you? And, um, and then perhaps most fascinating is that um, in a number of our recent surveys, we actually ask people... Um, comparison questions. And these questions are, you know, kind of, how do you think you're doing related to your neighbor? And how do you think your community is doing related to other communities? And how do you think your country is doing related to other countries? And um, believe it or not, this has a lot to do with violence perpetration and actually probably how people respond to COVID. And so some of our initial research is coming back. We were already asking about all of these things to better understand violence, perpetration, and victimization. And it looks like a lot of these invisible dynamics also are at play in how we respond to COVID, how afraid we are of COVID, what, how we think our communities are changing um, based on this threat. And that's been um, really interesting. What's interesting, uh, and you know, this, this may sound so you you would enjoyed that last question this one may sound a little more ignorant um but i it's i'm just curious uh because you know the impact of something like this could actually stabilize versus destabilize uh you know um, nations or communities has covid helped to stabilize these communities in conflict i mean it seems that just the risk of conflict in and of itself you know, would be higher in the setting of, of this pandemic? Um, has it brought communities together? Or have you seen that it's actually been more destabilizing uh, to these kind of communities in, or these, you know, communities or nations in conflict, these peoples in conflict? You know, I, I know it sounds that it'd be, it would be odd that there'd be stabilization, but sometimes you see, you know, a change in, in the way things are happening um, we didn't see as much violence, even you know, in the United States, um, till again recently um, during this, because you know the pandemic was really so overwhelming. What has been your experience with that? Has there been stabilization? Has it been destabilization? And I hope that's not too ignorant of a question to ask. No, and uh, it's not because I think people are going to be studying this for years to come, and I don't think we have a definitive answer yet. But it is absolutely fascinating, right? So on, I would say it depends on the kind of conflict you're talking about. So sadly, um, as I think many of us have heard, we um, often hear from the United Nations and world leaders about the shadow pandemic, right? And so the shadow pandemic is this idea that um, violence that's not, try again. <laughs> um, the idea of the shadow pandemic uh, is that, you know, violence that might have kind of occurred in public spaces or have taken the form of crime was now occurring within homes. And so um, we heard a lot about how extreme increases in domestic violence, so violence against children or violence against women. And you can imagine um, all of the reasons for that that make an enormous amount of sense, right? So there's financial stress, there's isolation, there's extreme psychological stress, um, a sense of uncertainty. And then you layer on top of that crowding within small spaces with no outlet for stress. And of course, you're going to see increases in violence. So on the interpersonal level, I think we do acknowledge that, um, that the COVID pandemic sadly can increase violence within the home. But 
more intriguing and perhaps harder to talk about definitively is how it might have affected conflict situations. You know, has conflict reduced or has it increased? And what is really interesting is I know that there was quite a few calls for ceasefires, but, you know, you just have to look at the news to acknowledge that that didn't necessarily work. And we're seeing a great deal of violence and instability around the world. Um, in the place that I work in Eastern DRC, we actually tried to get at exactly this question. So when the pandemic hit, we were in the middle of doing a large population-based survey in the east of the country. And of course, um, we ceased all of those activities and came back. But when there was a lull in the pandemic and the DRC government allowed um, public health programs to resume with appropriate distancing measures, we were able to actually go out and um, uh, do socially distance interviewing for this survey again. Um, one of the things that we asked about was we kind of added all these questions about COVID and how it was affecting people in their communities. And what we found was that um, some people said, uh, like about 10% of people said that security in their community had increased, security had increased as a result of the pandemic. You know, maybe people were kind of hunkering down and everything was calming down, but um, about 10% also said secu security decreased, right? So they felt less secure. And these are conflict affected places. So, you know, that's usually pretty palpable. Either there's presence of armed groups or you can hear shelling or, um, you know, gunfire. And so, uh, but the biggest part was the middle of the bell curve as it always is. A lot of people said insecurity had stayed the same during the pandemic. What was really fascinating is we started to run some quick numbers and you know, um, this hasn't been published, but we found that people who reported they were less secure as a result of the pandemic, that violence had increased, that their communities were affected by conflict, um, were also much less likely to say that they know where to go if they need help and much less likely to say that they had people in their lives who um, could support them and who they respected. Um, so it was interesting just to see the links between people who felt um, the conflict increased during COVID and how those same people were so much less likely to report having additional resources that they could go to to draw on. And so it's, it's a correlation, it's not causation, but I think we can acknowledge that this is just another data point that people affected by the pandemic were folks who, you know, already didn't have a lot of resources to draw on or don't feel like they have resources to draw on during the pandemic. And one of the things that was most interesting about this analysis is that we actually adjusted for how people felt before the pandemic. So whether, no matter what you felt, your community, no matter um, what the level of security you felt in your community before the pandemic, if you thought it got worse during the pandemic, you also said you had fewer places to go to get support. Um, but two stories that I wanted to tell to get at your point, Stephen, about how people are handling this and how they're pivoting is that um, these are also some of the most like beautifully resilient and thoughtful communities um, in the world that I happen to have the privilege of working in. So um, I work with this woman, human rights activist in mining towns, um, and her name is Annie. And we had uh, created this program where we had kind of comic book based um, images to raise awareness about public health, women's rights, and occupational safety in mining towns in Eastern DRC, because mining towns are a big economic driver. But they're also places where women face a lot of um, insecurity. So we already had this program running where we had um, kind of visual images that raised awareness around all these um, challenging issues in these informal economies. And Annie kind of took it on herself to now create comic book images around COVID safety, around hand washing, about what the pandemic was and how to stay safe. And so you saw someone who had, you know, not very few resources kind of pivot in real time to address the pandemic. And um, similarly, I work with um, this other wonderful human rights defender named Amani, which means peace in Swahili. And he runs a um, school for orphaned youth in conflict. And the school has this amazing model where um, 
kids get a normal education, but they also get kind of income generating training as well. And that you can train to be a carpenter or a seamstress. And um, as the kids graduate, a lot of their skills go back into making the school a better place for the next incoming cohort of students. So the carpenters help build more classrooms and the seamstresses uh, sew school uniforms. But when, you know, the pandemic hit, Amani had all of those amazing alumna and current students sewing masks and, you know, creating increased hand washing facilities and putting up signs to help people understand what the pandemic was all about. And so, um, I feel like we don't always hear those stories of incredible hope and resilience and grace and kindness. And those are the things that really stand out for me, um, even while we can acknowledge that vulnerable populations are some of the hardest hit. Yeah, those are important stories for us to hear because we always hear about the conflict, um, but you don't hear about the incredible resilience and the efforts that the people oftentimes most affected will do to overcome that. and. Just it's just great to hear. I really enjoy the story about you know just hunkering down and sewing masks and building you know hand washing facilities. You know and you know that's that's incredible when you consider the other stressors that they're dealing with that we don't have to deal with. You know we had these efforts for people sewing masks here in the U.S., which was so greatly appreciated. But then when you think about you know, that they're also in conflict and they're you know, worried about their own daily survival. Those are it just uh, heartwarming, you know, kind of stories about resilience and, and, and how people can overcome just incredible tragedy and incredible, um, you know, stressors uh, to still give give like that. Totally. I mean, so one of the things that came out from the survey, because we were um, also trying to report back to donors about the challenges in these communities in real time to address some of these issues is that, you know, those same communities that were sewing masks and putting together art to raise awareness, we found that um, 70 percent of people said that um, their the food that they had to eat drastically decreased after the pandemic hit and that fully 60 percent had skipped a meal in the past week. And so if you think about kind of the enormous amount of deprivation and vulnerability there, you know, these are communities that are often very much on the edge of survival and the pandemic not only has these direct medical effects, but what we found is it had all of these, um, you know, often unexpected kind of knock-on effects. So we found that when people talked about why food security had increased as a result of the lockdown, they said um, the uh, currency, underwent extreme inflation and that's particularly a problem in informal economies that are not necessarily regulated on the international market that um markets and infrastructure had shut down so food was just not moving through the country anymore and then you know if you can't work um you have a decreased income and that was also very much at play so we saw that you know and that's all because of the pandemic and those aren't medical issues per se but they have a clear and immediate clinical impact, right? If people are not eating enough, they are not gonna be able to uh, have strong immune systems and fight off any number of medical conditions, including including COVID. So that was something that really struck us. Um, yeah, certainly. I mean, in many of these communities, um, you know, based on tradition or need, live in tight quarters, can't social distance, um, have to continue working, uh, and the and then you add on on malnutrition, lack of access to, you know, any healthcare in some settings, and it's just it's just set up for disaster. Um, I'm not sure if this is an area of your focus or if this is an area that you've thought of. You know, as vaccines start to be you know widely distributed in in many countries, um, what what will be the access to especially the the most vulnerable to these vaccines are these something that are going to be likely to be distributed by you know something like the UN or World Health Organization with some sort of equity or do you feel that this is going to be another um, you know uh, a vaccine is going to be another black market product or something that 
these individuals just aren't going to have access to and, you know, are going to be at continued risk. Is that an area that, you know, the HHI or you have some, some experience with or background to? Yeah, it's a great question. And I know, you know, it's top of mind for global leaders and people are advocating for vaccine equity um, around the globe. And I, I do think we're going to be you know, judged for our actions. Now, Stephen, it really reminded me of when you were talking about kind of um, this idea of this could be a moment for extraordinary giving, or it can almost entrench you and make people feel, you know, if they're threatened or if they um, feel this existential kind of um, encroachment from the COVID pandemic that they just want to stockpile and hoard. And I think, um, I know that the global community has talked about the importance of vaccine equity, but I haven't seen a lot of movement on that front. And I think one of, you know, the most heartbreaking case studies is seeing what's happening in India, which is a huge producer of vaccines and um, didn't have a stockpile to draw on and is now asking the global community that they supported to return that support in their time of greatest need. Um, I'd like to think that um, we have some infrastructure in some of the world's most remote places to begin to undertake vaccine distribution. Um, and certainly we have like decades long structures of NGOs and the UN and state systems setting up healthcare infrastructure in some of these places. And we have success stories in the fields of public health. We learn about, you know, the eradication of polio and guinea worm and, you know, these extraordinary efforts that were undertaken to improve the health of communities. But I also think we've learned that when you become less vigilant or you stop educating people about the importance of these measures, you see just bizarre disinformation campaigns that I think a lot of public health personnel couldn't have anticipated, right? Well, we know vaccines work, so we can just kind of sit back and let that information speak for itself. And now we know that, that we can't and we have to be thoughtful and um, vigilant and work with kind of community champions and trusted community spokespeople to raise awareness around what we need to do to beat this pandemic. And I think um, what's really interesting in conflict zones is you often have you know, this infrastructure of grassroots rights activists, defenders, peace activists who could step in and fill this role and speak to communities who are among the most marginalized. And I just hope that we're able to kind of leverage those incredible humans to help us in this effort to distribute the vaccine in these incredibly, incredibly remote places. Oh, good. Um, and then I think we have probably time for one more question from me, and that is, you know, research often begets more research. What are some of the questions that you think have come out of what you've learned from this experience thus far? Uh, you know, you probably, I, I'm assuming you went in with some questions. What's developed for, um, you know, questions that you maybe hadn't anticipated, um, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, from the research that you've done thus far and, and that you hope to maybe try to answer in the next, you know, few months, few years, um, what's what's come out of the research you've had and what, what are some questions you hope to, to ask moving forward? Well, you know, this is every researcher's favorite question. So I assume it's a two hour podcast, right? <laughs> um, well, so basically we've already seen unexpected connections between COVID and violence. And we've seen some unexpected connections between um, how people perceive COVID changing their communities and some of these other factors like individual resilience or a sense of social cohesion. And one thing I'd like to consider is whether we can trace the you know, mathematical pulse of the pandemic um, across time the same way that we did with conflict. So we saw high conflict and years and years and years later, we see that, you know, it changes the way people interact with each other in unexpected ways. And it'll be interesting 
and important to understand places that were highly affected by the pandemic, does it leave that same kind of years long signature in human behavior going forward? You know, I'd love to be able to investigate that. I think we have the tools to investigate that. Um, another piece of the research, and you know, frankly, this has been very top of mind as an American, watching the news over the past few years, watching people kind of um, retreat to entrenched positions and really solidify ideas of who's an in-group and who's an out-group and who's like them and who's not, who believes what they do and who doesn't. Um, this sense of grievance or in-group, out-groupness, or you know, do you feel like people are somehow better off than you are? And does that feel fair, unfair? You know, I think it it affects the way that we respond to crisis. I think it affects the way we respond to the pandemic and respond to each other. And um, I'm really interested in looking at how those factors might play into our understanding of the pandemic and our recovery from the pandemic. In other settings, we've seen these exact things affect the way communities do peace and reconciliation, the way that they um, create uh, leadership structures. Um, one of the most exciting and unexpected findings from one of our projects was that we saw social cohesion and in-group, out-group stuff affect the way people feel about the environment and the way that they feel uh, about conservation, which is really unexpected, right? So I don't think it's such a far cry to think that um, all of these dynamics and kind of like this increasing polarization might might impact the way that we recover from the pandemic as well. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, a global community of researchers starts to dig into that. Well, this is incredibly important work. Um, these are incredibly important questions. Uh, I laud you for for your work uh you're much braver than i for going into these you know conflict areas uh and uh you know th this is this these are going to be important questions for us to answer and these are important populations for us to to think about and care about um and to support uh so i'm sure people want to um connect with you um connect with your work what are the best ways for our listeners to you know, dive deeper a little bit into the work you're doing and, and how can they connect with you, um, you know, through either HHI or through social media. I'm not going to give your cell phone number out, but uh, if you want to, um, please I, don't do that. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I think everyone has my cell phone number because I, I get spam <laughs> calls like 24 right. seven. So it's out there in the ether somewhere. Um, yeah, we love to hear from folks. We love collaborations. And, um, you know, we're on Twitter at Harvard uh, GR2. You can check out our website um, uh, at HHI. I will look up our website because I should have it memorized and I don't. Um, and I'm on Twitter at JTD Kelly. But I would say the one place that I would love folks to go um, if they want to learn a little bit more is we created a website for this beautiful comic book based curriculum that we uh, created with our Congolese collaborators and there you can see images and videos and check out photos of these incredible um, human rights defenders and that's um, resourcefulempowerment.com if you just google that um, I think it'll come up there's a dash between resource and full because it's um, an intervention conducted in mining towns. So it's natural resources, it's honey resourceful empowerment. Anyway, this is what happens when you're home all the time during a pandemic with extra time on your hands. Um, so those are some ways to connect. And um, Stephen, you are definitely as brave as I am and you're cordially invited to come to DRC and hang out and check out these programs and talk to folks about public health and uh, extreme medicine. So uh, hopefully when the world opens up, uh, some of your colleagues and you will be in these extraordinary places. Uh, I hope because well. I've not been able to leave the ICU uh, since this started. Um, but uh, I'd like to get out of the ICU at some point. Um, and, and that would be, I, I will certainly take you up on that invitation for sure.
Um, well, again, Dr. Kelly, thank you so much. I'll make sure to post those websites uh, in our um, podcast notes so that information will be there. Um, I want to thank everyone for listening. Um, please make sure to visit worldextrememedicine.com for the latest educational content, including our live events and podcasts, as well as webcast.podbean.com. Although you probably have already visited that because that's how you listen to this podcast. Uh, so hopefully you're there. And if you're interested in becoming a WEM fellow, um, you can visit www.extreme-fellowship.com. Um, it's the most extreme fellowship in austere medicine. Uh, lots of great um, you know, contacts uh, and, and people to uh, meet and mingle with. Thank you again. Um, certainly everyone stay warm, stay cool, stay safe. And we'll see you next time on the World Extreme Medicine podcast. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, for your your uh, giving us your time. Thank you, Stephen, and all of the first responders and medical professionals who are listening to this. You kept us going during one of the hardest times in the world. So thank you all. Thanks so much.